have some linear equality constraints, which we'll put in the matrix form as AX equals B for some matrices A and B. Uh, the key point here is that all of my functions F naught through F sub M are convex in my variable of interest X. We're interested in problems of this form for two reasons. Uh, first, we can solve them. The convex analysis is a very well-known field. There's many algorithms and solvers out there that will get you a solution to this type of problem quickly and efficiently. Secondly, convex optimization problems arise in many different applications in many different fields, including machine learning and statistics. So here you'll see some statistical problems that are convex. You probably see in least squares and non-negative least squares. A rigid lasso regression or elastic net from GlimNet, isotonic regression, Huber robust regression, logistic regression, support vector machines, sparse inverse covariance estimation, which we'll see an example of in detail later, maximum entropy estimation or related problems, as well as many new methods being mentioned every year at conferences like these. For any one of these problems, you could probably download an R package and solve it. But what I'm offering with CVXR is a single unified package to solve the entire class of convex optimization problems. In the past 10 years, DSLs or domain-specific languages for convex optimization have risen in popularity. Already tens of thousands of users um, have been using software like CVX in MATLAB, CVXPy in Python, YAOMIP, another MATLAB package, and convex.jl in Julia to solve their problems. These DSLs may be slower than custom code you write in Fortran or C. However, their advantage is that they're extremely flexible, which enables you to quickly prototype new models and methods on your data set. Here, for example, is just some code uh, in CVXPy to solve a basic norm minimization problem. As you can see, there's only about five lines. Um, all the lines are very readable. They're mathematically intuitive. It's almost an exact translation of something you'd write pen and paper or in LaTeX. Uh, you know, the first line, you're defining beta as a variable. Second line is your cost function. Third line, you're saying my problem is to minimize that cost, and then you solve and get your result. So CVXR brings these cool capabilities to R. Um, it connects to many R, uh, many new solvers. So we have ECOS and SCS, uh, two open source solvers. Uh, and we also have Mozik and Garobi, which I think many of you will be happy about since they're professional grade solvers a lot of statisticians use in the community. Um, CVXR mixes easily with any other R library. So what you can do is you can import your data, uh, use dplyr to munge it or transform it in some way. Then you can fit your model using CVXR, take the results, and then plot them in ggplot, or you can do some animation, or use Shiny to make a web app. So it's great for integrating everything into R. Finally, CVXR uses Discipline Convex Programming, or DCP, which is a rule set to determine the convexity of your optimization problem. Um, in this talk, I don't have time to go into the details of the rules, but you can read the paper in a chapter of a book on Stephen Boyd's website. I can assure you the rules are fairly simple to read and understand, and once you understand them, it's very straightforward to take your convex problem and put it into a DCP-compliant format. In fact, we already provide a library of examples and many functions, um, which we call atoms, to help you in this process. So let's jump right into an example. Uh, I'm going to start with the simplest thing possible, just to give you a sense of how CVXR syntax works. We're going to solve OOS, least squares, minimize uh, x beta minus y, beta minus y, beta is our variable, x and y are the constants. So this is the code in CVXR to solve that problem. As you can see, it's not too different from CVXPy, which I showed before. Uh, the first line, uh, beta, is uh, we define a variable object uh, of size n. n is something that you would set n equals 5 or something. Uh, the second line, I'm defining my objective function. Now, I'm using this uh, atom called sum underscore squares, which is providing the CVXR library, uh, which tells the CVXR that this is a sum of squares problem object. Uh, and then I pass in y minus x beta, as you normally would. My third line is the problem definition. That's straightforward. Problem is to minimize this objective. And then so far, we haven't actually solved our problem. What we have done is we created this, um, this expression tree, essentially, that CVXR will now parse, uh, run its DCP checks on, then process. You don't have to worry about anything it does in the background. It'll just process it and send it to whatever solver it is that you tell it to. Um, by default, it'll send it to ECOS, but you can give it a new argument and say solver equals Mozek, and it'll do whatever it needs to do to give it to Mozek. Um, then the solver will run, and it'll get results, and then CVXR returns the results in a regular R list. So my result, dollar sign value, gives the optimal objective value, and then result beta gives my optimal objective uh, function um, beta value. 
Uh, so that's great, you said. Uh, I've uh, solved least squares 10 times slower than my custom Fortran code. Why should I use CDXR? Well, uh, the reason is that if you want to make changes, like adding constraints, adding regularizers or something, normally you'd have to go looking for a different R package, or you'd have to make significant changes in your own code to do this. But in CDXR, it's only a few lines. So for example, I'm going to solve uh, least squares again, but with a non-negativity constraint on my betas. And here's all I have to do. There's literally three, four lines. I have one line to define constraints, and that's just a list. As you can see, the list only has one object, which is beta greater than or equal to zero, representing the constraint. Uh, I have a second argument that passes in that constraint object. And I just resolve, and now result two dollar sign value is my optimal in an LS objective value. And similarly, I'll get the objective value for beta. Here, you've noticed I've re reused my variables and expressions and constraints because they exist outside of any problem. So you can resolve a problem with a different objective, same objective, but different constraints, or same constraints and different objective. You can uh, create a regularizer uh, function and then uh, do minimize parentheses objective minus plus regularizer. Um, it's very flexible as a DSL. Uh, so here I've just plotted some of my results uh, from some simulated data in ggplot to show that this is possible. Uh, true values are in green. These are my beta values. Uh, the blue values are OOS results. As you can see, OOS is not great because half the values are negative when we want them to be non-negative. The other ones overshoot significantly. Uh, and then I've added my red values from non-negative least squares, and clearly they are a much better fit. So let's go to a more, um, uh, more involved example, uh, now that you know the basic syntax of CDXR. We're going to solve the sparse inverse covariance estimation problem. Uh, we're given samples x sub i, x sub i are in vectors, drawn iid from a normal distribution, centered at zero with some unknown sigma covariance matrix. Uh, all we know about the covariance sigma is that it has a sparse inverse, which we will call s, and we want to estimate s. So one natural way to do this is to maximize the log of likelihood function, uh, but we're going to add a new sparsity constraint, and the sparsity constraint is simply that the L1 norm of my matrix S is less than or equal to some parameter alpha. Uh, alpha is something that's user-defined. Uh, and then this is, if you simplify the log of likelihood function, you get this problem, which is a convex problem. You're maximizing log determinant of S minus trace of S times Q. Q is your sample covariance. And your constraint is S must be positive semi-definite, uh, and then the uh, sparsity constraint. So here is, again, uh, the code is very simple in CVXR. So my first line, I define S, and now I'm using the semi-def constructor because I'm saying that S must be in a positive semi-definite cone. Uh, my second line is the objective function. Now I've used two of CVXR's atoms. Uh, log debt to represent the log determinant, and a matrix trace to represent the trace of S times Q. You could also replace matrix trace with some of the diag of S times Q. I'm just using the atoms that I have in CVXR because it's a little more convenient. Um, the third line is my constraints. Uh, that's pretty straightforward. Alpha is uh, a parameter that I set, so I can actually run this in a loop, which I'll show later, um, and change alpha and do some kind of cross-validation. Uh, then my problem is to maximize this, this uh, objective function with this constraint, and then I solve and get my S back, value back. Uh, oh, so one thing you might ask is, why didn't I do law of parentheses determinant of, of S? Uh, the reason is that the determinant is not a supported atom in CVXR. Um, you can see the list of supported atoms on a CVXR website, which I'll give in our last slide. It's a very long list, uh, but certain atoms you sort of have to use the uh, CVXR version. Um, because we don't have the determinant itself defined in the package. Anyways, here's just some results again from simulated data. Left-hand side, uh, or rather your right-hand side, is the true inverse. Uh, the light-colored blocks are zeros, and dark-colored blocks are non-zeros. With a small alpha equals one, as you can see, my uh, inverse is, uh, is a fairly sparse, you know, mostly zeros except on a diagonal. As I increase alpha, I get a more dense matrix, and then alpha equals 10, my, half my matrix is non-zeros. So that's it. Um, future work for CVXR, well, we're going to flesh out some of the convex functions or atoms in the library. 
uh, we'll definitely develop more applications and examples. You can find a very large list of examples and vignettes on our markdowns. You can run them right on your computer at our official website, cvxr.rbind.io, or in a CRAM package itself. Uh, for developers who are interested, we're going to make connecting new solvers much easier, so you can put your new solver and connect it in using some of the reduction functions we'll add. And finally, we're going to do some speed improvements, add warm start, and various other things to make running CVXR smoother for the end user. Uh, so thank you for coming to my talk, and uh, definitely check out our CVXR website and install our package, and let me know what you think. <laughs> Plenty of time for questions. I can run more examples, you know. <laughs> Um, I'm not familiar with the base optimization package. So what CVXR is, it's, it's a DSL, so it's a front end. And it takes um, the, you, you define a problem in it. And then the solvers are separate. So it's like Mozic or Garobi are different separate solvers. And they'll run, uh, you know, their runtime depends on the size of your problem and the type of data you run and the type of problem of the SDP or some linear function or other. So it's a separate, it's a kind of a separate issue. Oh, okay. Um, you do lose some, oh yes, yeah, so uh, the question is that uh, how much uh, do I lose in terms of runtime and overhead compared to a fun, um, something that's dedicated to just using Mozic directly? Uh, so there is some overhead and, uh, and it takes a bit of time, especially for large problems to process the DCP checks. Uh, the reason for that is that um, S4, which is the uh, cl uh, classing system we use, is a bit slow in that respect and a w for a large expression it needs to walk through an entire expression tree. And, uh, and, uh, and process it and run a DCP rule. So actually we've added a, um, a little option only for advanced users, um, but I'll tell you anyway, which uh, says, uh, you know, uh, check DCP equals false, or I think is DCP equals false, and that'll skip that DCP check. So if you're like, completely sure that your problem's already DCP compliant and convex, um, and you're just changing some data sets, then you can skip that check and it's much faster. Uh, so the question is, uh, can you pass derivative information into the software? Uh, you don't really need to. Uh, again, CVXR is a DSL front end for other solvers. I think if a solver has specific arguments, so if you, um, I don't know if Mozic takes derivatives, but like, let's say, you know, your solver ha does take derivatives as an argument, you can pass that into the solve function. So I go back here. There's a solve function. I, I did solve prob, right? But I can have other arguments. So there's an extra argument so you can put like solver arguments equals, and then you can put stuff in. And it'll, it'll pass that directly into the solver as if you were sending it to Mozic yourself. Um. Uh, I haven't tested how, oh yes, what is the limit um, in terms of dimensions of the problem? Uh, I haven't tested really large problems on it yet, um, but uh, I'm sure it, it runs fine, all the DCP checks run fine. It just might be slower in terms of processing the data because a lot of that is done in R. Uh, and for the future, we're going to push a lot of that into C, which will make it much faster. Is it pro possible to do log linear optimization? Um, I believe so, if that's a convex problem, and I believe uh, it, it is. Um, you can s set starting values for your problem. That's actually another argument you go into put into the solve function. Um, or uh, we're going to soon add some warm start support so that you can run it multiple times, and the set times after the first time, uh, it'll be faster. Um, I think we may have 
done some timings and put that in a CVXR paper. You can check it on uh, our website. Uh, we haven't run timing tests uh, significantly because, again, we have still have plans to do some improvements on the speed by putting a lot of the checks into C. I have a question. Uh, uh, if you reduce, for instance, non-linear least squares, mm -hmm. or least squares Right. So I just, I just well, gave, your, yeah. Your objects that they create, they, they know something about the problem. Can, do they pass that to the solvers automatically? You have to be able to repeat the problem. Right. So um, I think the question is that for some of the simple uh, examples I went through, uh, I might be able to calculate derivatives and can I pass that into a solve function? And a separate question was, uh, uh, you know, what exactly is CDSR doing? Like, what does it know about sum squares? Uh, so the, I'll answer the second question first. Um, actually, the atoms, uh, we have programmed in a lot of mathematical um, characteristics, so like its, uh, its shape, its size, and then we've used um, uh, essentially a graph implementation. So there's certain mathematics going on in the background um, that's code, hard-coded in for each of the atoms, and uh, I can definitely get you the chapter of the book that goes into the details of this. Um, but rest assured, it's actually not a trivial thing to add a new atom because you need to sort of pen and paper some of the mathematics to tell CVXR, you know, this is, this is a convex function or it's increasing, and here is its, like, uh, graph implementation, uh, and this is how you, you know, change and modify your data to, uh, to send it off to the solver for the sum squares. Um, as for the, the derivatives, um, I really don't think, I mean, this is just an example I've given that's very easy. I don't think we really, you know, use the derivatives directly because we don't assume that our comics functions are differentiable. So we, we don't use those, uh, you know, the typical gradient descent um, methods. Yeah. So let's all thank you.